dweller of the dark. We are a channel honoring the yellowed and blackened bones of many prominent authors. We will be digging up several obscure, strange, and forgotten authors who influence many of the great horror, science fiction, and fantasy writers today. Comment below if you like. If you have authors that you'd like to see recognized, list them in the comments or contact our author page. Authors, always looking for fresh blood. Subscribe and contact us for more information. Subscribe for more tales of the horrifying, obscure, strange, and forgotten. We'll have quite a collection climbing out of the tombs. If you like any of our tales, crush or cut the like button below. Check out our other stories on YouTube and our websites. YouTube, Dweller of the Dark. Official website, DwellerofTheDark.com. On Facebook, find us on Jeffrey LeBlanc Horror Writer. Check out our books on Amazon. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, and Bandcamp. Dweller of the Dark. A dimensionless vampire attacks a man from the stars. Hotel clerk Norman Bates has trouble controlling his murderous mother. And a submarine crew battle the undead as we creep around the block. Robert Block, his latest story may make your skin crawl. Our From the Grave mentor, Robert Block, was a fiction writer with a diverse array of stories in crime, horror, fantasy, and science fiction. He is best known as the writer of Psycho that led to Alfred Hitchcock's masterpiece and many great tales on Rod Serling's Night Gallery, Weird Tales, Strange Stories, and others. Our personal favorite is Block's script for the Hammer Horror Film Classic, The House That Dripped Blood. Horror and comedy were his trademark. Robert Block's fondness for humor and horror was evident in puns. It can be seen in the titles of his story collections such as Tales in a Juggler Vein, such stuff as screens are made of, and Out of the Mouths of Graves. And of course, there's the classic Block favorite line that tickles our funny bone. I have the heart of a child. I keep it in a jar on my shelf. A protege of H.P. Lovecraft, Robert Block was in a select group known as the Lovecraft Circle, with such greats as Frank Belknap Long, Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, and many more. Learning with these masters, Block created hundreds of short stories and over 30 novels. Robert Block won numerous awards in writing. He won the Hugo Award for That Hellbound Train, which is on YouTube on our channel, the Bram Stoker Award, the World Fantasy Award. Block served the term as president of the Mystery Writers of America, 1970. He was a member of the Mystery Writers of America, Science Fiction Writers of America, the Writers Guild of America, and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Most notably, there is one society he probably still is an undead member of, the Count Dracula Society. Beatles is a short story written by Robert Block and published for Weird Tales in December 1938. This creeper no doubt influenced John Carpenter's 1987 horror classic, Prince of Darkness, and others. Block's version, though, hatches enough dread and unease to make your skin crawl. The slurred tale centers on archaeologist Arthur Hartley and the change he has been going through since arriving back from the Sudan. Can our narrator help the terrified Arthur Hartley with his sudden change? Or will Arthur become another victim to the curse of the Scarabaeus? Beatles by Robert Block When Hartley returned from Egypt, his friends said he had changed. The specific nature of that change was difficult to detect, for none of his acquaintances got more than a casual glimpse of him. He dropped around to the club just once, and then retired to the seclusion of his apartments. His manner was so definitely hostile, so markedly antisocial, that very few of his cronies cared to visit him, and the occasional callers were not received. It caused considerable talk at the time, gossip rather. 
those who remembered Arthur Hartley in the days before his expedition abroad were naturally quite cut up over the drastic metamorphosis in his manner. Hartley had been known as a keen scholar, a singularly erudite field worker in his chosen profession of archaeology, but at the same time he had been a peculiarly charming person. He had the worldly flair usually associated with the fictional characters of E. Phillips Oppenheim and a positively devilish sense of humor which mocked and belittled it. He was the kind of fellow who could order the precise wine at the proper moment, at the same time grinning as though he were as much surprised by it all as his guest of the evening. And most of his friends found this air of culture, without ostentation, quite engaging. He had carried this urbane sense of the ridiculous over into his work, and while it was known that he was very much interested in archaeology and a notable figure in the field, he inevitably referred to his studies as pottering around with old fossils and the old fossils that discovered them. Consequently, his curious reversal following his trip came as a complete surprise. All that was definitely known was that he had spent some eight months on a field trip to the Egyptian Sudan. Upon his return, he had immediately severed all connections with the institute he had been associated with. Just what had occurred during the expedition was a matter of excited conjecture among his former intimates. But something had definitely happened. It was unmistakable. The night he spent at the club proved that. He had come in quietly, too quietly. Hartley was one of those persons who usually made an entrance in the true sense of the word. His tall, graceful figure, attired in the immaculate evening dress, so seldom found outside of the pages of melodramatic fiction. His truly leonine head with its Stokowski-like bristle of gray hair these attributes commanded attention. He could have passed anywhere as a man of the world or a stage magician awaiting his cue to step onto the platform. But this evening he entered quietly, unobtrusively. He wore dinner clothes but his shoulders sagged and the spring was gone from his walk. His hair was grayer and it hung pallidly over his tanned forehead. Despite the bronze of Egyptian sun on his features, there was a sickly tinge to his countenance. His eyes peered mistily from amidst unsightly folds. His face seemed to have lost its mold. The mouth hung loosely. He greeted no one and took a table alone. Of course, cronies came up and chatted, but he did not invite them to join him. And oddly enough, none of them insisted although normally they would gladly have forced their company upon him and jollied him out of a black mood, which experience had taught them was easily done in his case. Nevertheless, after a few words with Hartley, they all turned away. They must have felt it even then. Some of them hazarded the opinion that Hartley was still suffering from some form of fever contracted in Egypt, but I do not think they believed this in their hearts. From their shocked descriptions of the man, they seemed one and all to sense the peculiar, alien quality about him. This was an Arthur Hartley they had never known, an aged stranger with a querulous voice which rose in suspicion when he was questioned about his journey. Stranger he truly was, for he did not even appear to recognize some of the men who greeted him, and when he did it, was with an abstracted manner, a clumsy way of wording it. But what else is there to say when an old friend stares blankly into silence upon meeting, and his eyes seem to fasten on far-off terrors that affright him? That was the strangeness they all grasped in Hartley. He was afraid. Fear bestrode those sagging shoulders. Fear breathed a pallor into that ashy face. Fear grinned into those empty, far-fixed eyes. Fear prompted the suspicion in the voice. 
They told me. And that is why I went round to see Arthur Hartley in his rooms. Others had spoken of their efforts in the week following his appearance at the club to gain admittance to his apartment. They said he did not answer the bell and complained that the phone had been disconnected. But that, I reasoned, was fear's work. I wouldn't let Hartley down. I had been a rather good friend of his, and I may as well confess that I scented a mystery here. The combination proved irresistible. I went up to his flat one afternoon and rang. No answer. I went into the dim hallway and listened for footsteps, some sign of life from within. No answer. Complete, utter silence. For a moment I thought crazily of suicide, then laughed the dread away. It was absurd, and still there had been a certain dismay, unanimity, in all the reports I had heard of Hartley's mental state. When the stolidest, most hard-headed of the club bores concurred in their estimate of the man's condition, I might well worry. Still, suicide. I rang again, more as a gesture, than in expectation of tangible results, and then I turned and descended the stairs. I felt, I recall, a little twinge of inexplicable relief upon leaving the place. The thought of suicide in that gloomy hallway had not been pleasant. I reached the lower door and opened it, and a familiar figure scurried past me on the landing. I turned. It was Hartley. For the first time since his return, I got a look at the man, and in the hallway shadows, he was ghastly. Whatever his condition at the club, a week must have accentuated it tremendously. His head was lowered, and as I greeted him, he looked up. His eyes gave me a terrific shock. There was a stranger dwelling in their depths, a haunted stranger. I swear he shook when I addressed him. He was wearing a tattered top coat, but it hung loosely over his gauntness. I noticed that he was carrying a large bundle done up in brown paper. I said something. I don't remember what. At any rate, I was at some pains to conceal my confusion as I greeted him. I was rather insistently cordial, I believe, for I could see that he would just as soon have hurried up the stairs without even speaking to me. The astonishment I felt converted itself into heartiness. Rather reluctantly, he invited me up. We entered the flat, and I noticed that Hartley double-locked the door behind him. That, to me, characterized his metamorphosis. In the old days, Hartley had always kept open house, in the literal sense of the word. Studies might have kept him late at the Institute, but a chance visitor found his door open wide, and now he double-locked it. I turned around and surveyed the apartment. Just what I expected to see, I cannot say, but certainly my mind was prepared for some sign of radical alteration. There was none. The furniture had not been moved. The pictures hung in their original places. The vast bookcases still stood in the shadows. Hartley excused himself, entered the bedroom, and presently emerged after discarding his top coat. Before he sat down, he walked over to the mantel and struck a match before a little bronze figurine of Horace. A second later, the thick gray spirals of smoke arose in the approved style of exotic fiction, and I smelt the pungent tang of strong incense. That was the first puzzle. I had unconsciously adopted the attitude of a detective looking for clues, or perhaps a psychiatrist ferreting out psychoneurotic tendencies, and the incense was definitely alien to the Arthur Hartley I knew. Clears away the smell, he remarked. 
I didn't ask what smell, nor did I begin to question him as to his trip, his inexplicable conduct in not answering my correspondence after he left Khartoum, or his avoidance of my company in this week following his return. Instead, I let him talk. He said nothing at first. His conversation rambled, and behind it, all I sensed the abstraction I had been warned about. He spoke of having given up his work and hinted that he might leave the city shortly and go up to his family home in the country. He had been ill. He was disappointed in Egyptology and its limitations. He hated darkness. The locust plagues had increased in Kansas. This rambling was insane. I knew it then, and I hugged the thought to me in the perverse delight which is born of dread. Partly was mad. Limitations of Egyptology? I hate the dark? The locust of Kansas? But I sat silently when he lighted the great candles about the room, sat silently staring through the incense clouds to where the flaming tapers illuminated his twitching features. And then he broke. You are my friend, he said. There was a question in his voice, a puzzled suspicion in his words that brought sudden pity to me. His derangement was terrible to witness. Still, I nodded gravely. You are my friend, he continued. This time the words were a statement. The deep breath which followed betokened resolution on his part. Do you know what was in that bundle I brought in? He asked suddenly. No. I'll tell you. Insecticide. That's what it was. Insecticide! His eyes flamed in triumph which stabbed me. I haven't left this house for a week. I dare not spread the plague. They follow me, you know. But today I thought of the way, absurdly simple too. I went out and bought insecticide, pounds of it, and liquid spray, special formula stuff, more deadly than arsenic. Just elementary science, really. But its very prosaicness may defeat the powers of evil. I nodded like a fool, wondering whether I could arrange for him be taken away that evening. Perhaps my friend, Dr. Sherman, might diagnose. Now let them come. It's my last chance. The incense doesn't work. And even if I keep the lights burning, they creep about the corners. Funny, the woodwork holds up. It should be riddled. What was this? But I forgot, said Hartley. You don't know about it. The plague, I mean, and the curse. He leaned forward, and his white hands made octopus shadows on the wall. I used to laugh at it, you know, he said. Archaeology isn't exactly a pursuit for the superstitious. Too much groveling in ruins, and putting curses on old pottery and battered statues never seemed important to me. But Egyptology? That's different. It's human bodies, there. Mummified, but still human. And the Egyptians were a great race. They had scientific secrets we haven't yet fathomed. And of course, we cannot even begin to approach their concepts in mysticism. Ah, there was the key. I listened intently. I learned a lot this last trip. We were after the excavation job in the new tombs up the river. I brushed up on the dynastic periods, and naturally, the religious significance entered into it. Oh, I know all the myths. The Bubatis legend, the Isis resurrection theory, the true names of Ra, the allegory of Set. We found things there in the tombs, wonderful things. The pottery, the furniture, the bas-reliefs we were able to remove. 
but the expeditionary reports will be out soon. You can read of it then. He found mummies too, cursed mummies. Now I saw it, I thought I did. And I was a fool. I did something I never should have dared to do for ethical reasons and for other more important reasons. Reasons that may cost me my soul. I had to keep my grip on myself. Remember that he was mad. Remember that his convincing tones were prompted by the delusions of insanity. Or else, in that dark room, I might have easily believed that there was a power which had driven my friend to this haggard brink. Yes, I did it. I tell you, I read the curse of Scarabaeus, sacred beetle, you know, and I did it anyway. I couldn't guess that it was true. I was a skeptic. Everyone is skeptical enough until things happen. Those things are like the phenomenon of death. You read about it, realize that it occurs to others, and yet cannot quite conceive of it happening to yourself. And yet it does. The curse of the Scarabaeus was like that. Thoughts of the sacred beetle of Egypt crossed my mind. And I remembered also the seven plagues. And I knew what he would say. We came back. On the ship I noticed them. They crawled out of the corners every night. When I turned the light on, they went away. But they always returned when I tried to sleep. I burned incense to keep them off. And then I moved into a new cabin. But they followed me. I did not dare tell anyone. Most of the chaps would have laughed. And the Egyptologist in the party wouldn't have helped much. Besides, I couldn't confess my crime. So I went on alone. His voice was a dry whisper. It was pure hell. One night on the boat, I saw the black things crawling in my food. After that, I ate in the cabin alone. I dared not see anyone now, for fear they might notice how the things followed me. They did follow me, you know. If I walked in shadow on the deck, they crept along behind. Only the sun kept them back, or a pure flame. I nearly went mad trying to account logically for their presence, trying to imagine how They got on the boat, but all the time I knew in my heart what the truth was. They were sending the curse. When I reached port, I went up and resigned. When my guilt was discovered, there would have been a scandal anyway, so I resigned. I couldn't hope to continue work with those things crawling all over wherever I went. I was afraid to look anyone up. Naturally, I tried. That one night at the club was ghastly, though. I could see them marching across the carpet and crawling up the sides of my chair. And it took all there was in me to keep from screaming and dashing out. Since then, I've stayed here, alone. Before I decide on any course for the future, I must fight the curse and win. Nothing else will help. I started to interject a phrase, but he brushed it aside and continued desperately. No, I couldn't go away. They followed me across the ocean. They haunt me in the streets. I could be locked up and they would still come. They come every night and crawl up the sides of my bed and try to get at my face and I must sleep soon or I'll go mad. They crawl over my face at night. They crawl. It was horrible to see the words ooze out between his set teeth, for he was fighting madly to control himself. Perhaps the insecticide will kill them. It was the first thing I should have thought of, but of course panic confused me. Yes, I put my trust in the insecticide. Grotesque. Isn't it? Fighting an ancient curse with insect powder? Spoke at last. They're beetles, aren't they? 
He nodded. Scarabaeus beetles. You know the curse. The mummies, under the protection of the scarab, cannot be violated. I knew the curse. It was one of the oldest known to history, like all legends. It has had a persistent life. Perhaps I could reason. But why should it affect you? I asked. Yes, I would reason with Hartley. Egyptian fever had deranged him, and the colorful curse story had gripped his mind. If I spoke logically, I might get him to understand his hallucination. Why should it affect you? I repeated. He was silent for a moment before he spoke, and then his words seemed to be wrung out of him. I stole a mummy, he said. I stole the mummy of a temple virgin. I must have been crazy to do it. Something happens to you under that sun. There was gold in the case, and jewels, and ornaments, and there was the curse written. I got them, both. I stared at him and knew that in this he spoke the truth. That's why I cannot keep up my work. I stole the mummy, and I am cursed. I didn't believe, but the crawling things came, just as the inscription said. At first I thought that was the meaning of the curse, that wherever I went the beetles would go too, that they would haunt me and keep me from men forever. But lately, I am beginning to think differently. I think the beetles will act as messengers of vengeance. I think they mean to kill me. This was pure raving. I haven't dared open the mummy case since. I'm afraid to read the inscription again. I have it here in the house, but I've locked it up and I won't show you. I want to burn it, but I must keep it on hand. In a way, it's the only proof of my sanity. And if the things kill me, snap out of it, I commanded. Then I started. I don't know the exact words I used, but I said reassuring, hearty, wholesome things. And when I finished, he smiled, the martyred smile of the obsessed. Delusions? They're real. But where do they come from? I can't find any cracks in the woodwork. The walls are sound, and yet every night, the beetles come and crawl up the bed and try to get at my face. They don't bite. They merely crawl. There are thousands of them. Black thousands of silent, crawling things, inches long. I brush them away, but when I fall asleep, they come back. They're clever. And I can't pretend. I've never caught one. They're too fast moving. They seem to understand me or the power that sends them understands. They crawl up from hell night after night and I can't last much longer. Some evening I'll fall completely asleep and they will creep over my face and then he leaped to his feet and screamed. Ah! The corner! In the corner now! Out of the walls! The black shadows were moving, marching. I saw a blur. Fancy, I could detect rustling forms advancing, creeping, spreading before the light. Hartley sobbed. I turned on the electric light. There was, of course, nothing there. I didn't say a word, but left abruptly. Hartley continued to sit huddled in his chair, his head in his hands. I went straight to my friend, Dr. Sherman. Two. He diagnosed it as I thought he would. Phobia, accompanied by hallucinations. Hartley's feeling of guilt over stealing the mummy haunted him. The visions of beetles resulted. All this Sherman studied with the mumbo-jumbo technicalities of the professional psychiatrist. But it was simple enough to 
Together we phoned the Institute, where Hartley had worked. They verified the story, and so far as they knew, Hartley had stolen a mummy. After dinner, Sherman had an appointment, but he promised to meet me at 10 and go with me again to Hartley's apartment. I was quite insistent about this, for I felt that there was no time to lose. Of course, this was a mawkish attitude on my part, but that strange afternoon session had deeply disturbed me. I spent the early evening in unnerving reflection. Perhaps that was the way all so-called Egyptian curses worked. A guilty conscience on the part of a tomb looter made him project the shadow of imaginary punishment on himself. He had hallucinations of retribution that might explain the mysterious two Ankh Amun deaths and certainly accounted for the suicides. And that was why I insisted on Sherman seeing Hartley that same night. I feared suicide very much, for if ever a man was on the verge of complete mental collapse, Arthur Hartley surely was. It was nearly 11, however, before Sherman and I rang the bell. There was no answer. We stood in the dark hallway as I vainly rapped, then pounded. The silence only served to augment my anxiety. I was truly afraid, or else I never would have dared using my skeleton key. As it was, I felt the end justified the means. We entered. The living room was bare of occupants. Nothing had changed since the afternoon. I could see that quite clearly, for all the lights were on and the guttering candle stumps still smoldered. Both Sherman and I smelt the reek of the insecticide quite strongly, and the floor was almost evenly coated with thick white insect powder. We called, of course, before I ventured to enter the bedroom. It was dark, and I thought it was empty until I turned on the lights and saw the figure huddled beneath the bedclothes. It was Arthur Hartley, and I needed no second glance to see that his white face was twisted in death. The reek of insecticide was strongest here, and incense burned, and yet there was another pungent smell, a musty odor, vaguely animal-like. Sherman stood at my side, staring. What shall we do? I asked. I'll get the police on the wire downstairs, he said. Touch nothing. He dashed out, and I followed him from the room, sickened. I could not bear to approach the body of my friend. That hideous expression on the face affrighted me. Suicide? Murder? Heart attack? I didn't even wish to know the manner of his passing. I was heartsick to think that we had been too late. I turned from the bedroom, and then that damnable scent came to my nostrils, redoubled, and I knew. Beetles! But how could there be beetles? It was all an illusion in poor Hartley's brain. Even his twisted mind had realized that there were no apertures in the walls to admit them, that they could not be seen about the place. And still, the smell rose on the air, the reek of death, of decay, of ancient corruption that reigned in Egypt. I followed the scent to the second bedroom, forced the door. On the bed lay the mummy case. Hartley had said he locked it up here. The lid was closed, but ajar. I opened it. The sides bore inscriptions, and one of them may have pertained to the Scarabaeus curse. I do not know, for I stared only at the ghastly, unshrouded figure that lay within. It was a mummy, 
and it had been sucked dry. It was all shell. There was a great cavity in the stomach, and as I peered within, I could see a few feebly crawling forms, inch long, black buttons with great writhing feelers. They shrank back in the light, but not before I saw the scarab patterns on the outer crusted backs. The secret of the curse was here. The beetles had dwelt within the body of the mummy. They had eaten it out and nested within, and at night they crawled forth. It was true then. I screamed once when the thought hit me and dashed back to Hartley's bedroom. I could hear the sound of footsteps ascending the outer stairs. The police were on their way, but I couldn't wait. I raced into the bedroom, dread tugging at my heart. Had Hartley's story been true after all? Were the Beatles really messengers of a divine vengeance? I ran into that bedroom where Arthur Hartley lay, stooped over his huddled figure on the bed. My hands fumbled the body, searching for a wound. I had to know how he had died. But there was no blood. There was no mark. And there was no weapon beside him. It had been shock or heart attack after all. I was strangely relieved when I thought of this. I stood up and eased the body back again on the pillows. I felt almost glad because during my search my hands had moved over the body while my eyes roved over the room. I was looking for beetles. Hartley had feared the beetles. The beetles that crawled out of the mummy. They had crawled every night, if his story was to be believed. Crawled into his room, up the bedposts, across the pillows. Where were they now? They had left the mummy and disappeared. And Hartley was dead. Where were they? Suddenly, I stared again at Hartley. There was something wrong with the body on the bed. When I had lifted the corpse, it seemed singularly light for a man of Hartley's build. As I gazed at him now, he seemed empty of more than life. I peered into that ravaged face more closely, and then I shuddered, for the cords on his neck moved convulsively. His chest seemed to rise and fall. His head fell sideways on the pillow. He lived, or something inside him did. And then, as his twisted features moved, I cried aloud, for I knew how Hartley had died and what had killed him. I knew the secret of the scare curse and why the beetles crawled out of the mummy to seek his bed. I knew what they had meant to do, what tonight they had done. I cried aloud as I saw Hartley's face move in hopes that my voice would drown that dreadful rustling sound which filled the room and came from inside Hartley's body. I knew that the scarab curse had killed him, and I screamed quite wildly as his mouth gaped slowly open. Just as I fainted, I saw Arthur Hartley's dead lips part, allowing a rustling swarm of black scarabeus beetles to pour out across the pillow. Thank you for listening. Have a great night. <laughs>